Page 93. Thereafter, Tom McCarty took Kavik for a walk every day it didn't rain. They'd go up the hill because the street ended within two blocks, and that was about as far as McCarty could walk without resting. McCarty would sit on a log, stretch his bad leg before him, and look out at the bay below and the distant sea. Kavik would sit beside him, yellow eyes searching far beyond the bay and the sea, looking always toward the north. Tom McCarty would pat the big head and say, You might as well forget it, big fella. It's a long way by boat or plane, farther than you could ever go. So quit breaking your heart over something that can never be. Kavik listened to the old man's gentle voice, cocking his head first one way, then the other. At the end, he placed a paw on McCarty's knee where the man patted it. McCarty lifted the paw and shook it gravely. It does no good to tell you this, he said, but believe me, I know. When it rained, McCarty took Kavik to his quarters above the garage. There, he'd take the chain off and let him run free. On his first inspection, Kavik's delicate nose sniffed out the parka hanging in the closet. The parka had been made by an Eskimo woman, and even now a faint aroma clung to it that pricked Kavik's nostrils. He thrust his nose against the thick fur and woofed loudly. You know what that is, huh? McCarty took out the parka, slipped into it, and stood before the mirror. I brought this parka down with me ten years ago. Wore it just once. We had a little old inch or two of snow, and I slipped it on and went outside. Everybody looked at me like I was some kind of freak. I've never worn it since. He studied his reflection critically. It was twenty pounds heavier then, and trail hard. He sighed and took off the parka. Know what you need down here in winter? He asked. Rubber boots, a rain slicker, and a sou'wester hat. Now ain't that a fine outfit for the likes of you and me? Winter came, but not as Kavik had known winter. It was drizzling rain that lasted for days, with the sun peeking through for a few hours at odd intervals. During one of these sunny days, George Hunter decided that he would take Kavik for his walk. I want him to get more used to me, he explained to Tom McCarty. I'm going to make a speech on Alaska soon and show my slides. I bought some of Kavik's winning, winning the North American. I want to tell him about him. Then I want him there so people can see him in the flesh. That ought to give them the thrill, huh, Mac? It sure ought to, Mr. Hunter, McCarty agreed. A few minutes later, Hunter strode out of the yard with Kavik on the chain, trotting dutifully at his heels. McCarty spent the time Hunter and Kavik were gone, cleaning up around the pen and the yard. He was still at this when Hunter returned, walking fast. The little man's face was stormy, and his thin lips were pressed tightly together. Kavik trotted obediently at his heels, head down, plumbed tail drooping. Hunter went straight to the enclosure, shoved Kavik inside, unsnapped the chain from his neck, and slammed the door. He whirled on McCarty, black eyes snapping, his voice cutting. Did you know about him? Know what? That he's the biggest coward on earth? That a good-sized chipmunk can run him to death? McCarty glanced at Kavik. I don't believe it. Listen, Mac, Hunter was savagely angry. You know that long white house at the end of the block? Well, they've got a dog there. As we went past, he came tearing out, barking his head off. What kind of dog? McCarty asked. How should I know? Just a dog, a little more than half as big as Kavik, I guess. Well, I thought Kavik would eat him alive. He could have, Mac, but did he? Oh, no, he said bitterly. He almost tore the chain out of my hands trying to get away. When he couldn't, he tried to hide behind me. He actually lay down on the sidewalk, Mac. Can you feature that? A man finally came out and called the dog off. Hunter shook his head. That great big tough looking wolf lying there on the sidewalk, whimpering. It was humiliating, Mac. Humiliating. You never ran into that with him? We always went up the other way. Up to the end of the street. There's no dogs up there. McCarty glanced at Kavik, lying in a corner of the cage, and looking as if he knew he'd disgraced himself and Hunter. 
just can't believe it. I can, Hunter said. I saw it. And Kurt Evans at the cannery tried to tell me how he was, but I wouldn't believe it. Kurt said the beating he took in the plane wreck knocked all the courage out of him. Well, something did. Hunter scowled at Kavik. I paid $2,000 for that dog, and he's not worth a plugged nickel. Two weeks from now, he's the star attraction when I show those slides and make that speech at the club. How can I show a thing like that? I'd be a laughing stock. No, you won't, McCarty said. Nobody needs to know. There won't be any other dogs there to scare him. You wouldn't have known today if you hadn't run into another dog that showed fight. Let him sit up there with you and take his bows. They'll never guess. Hunter considered that possibility. It could work, at that. You could hold him outside until I'm ready for him. Then I'll take him in. He won't have to be in the room more than 10 or 15 minutes while I make my little speech about him and everybody gets a good look at him. Yeah, it'll work. Hunter's voice turned tough. Then I'm getting rid of him. Quick. But he's still a nice dog, McCarty, McCarty pointed out. He looks like a big wolf sled dog. He makes a good show. And that's what you want him for, isn't it? Hunter shook his head. Sooner or later, somebody will find out what he's like. Then I'll feel like a fool. He's a cripple, Mac. A mental cripple. That's a lot worse than if he had only three legs. You can feel sorry for a three-legged dog because there's nothing he can do about it. But a coward, Mac, he said bitterly. Who, feel, who feels sorry for a coward? Especially a big, tough-looking one like him. There's no excuse for being a coward. None at all. Look at him. Big and strong and beautiful, and he grovels and whines. I won't have it. It's $2,000 down the drain, but he goes. That's final. I'd call off the show if I could. But you get him brushed up and looking as good as possible for the club members. I don't even want to see him again. Tom McCarty prepared havoc for the night of what he called Hunter's one-man show. The day of the show, he took Kavik to his quarters above the garage to groom him. After finishing, he stood back and studied the dog. You look fine, big fella, he said, big and strong, with plenty of good beef on your frame. Hard muscles, big chest, fine posture. You look like the lead dog that won the North American, all right. Nobody'd ever guess. He took the dog's big head in his hands and said, I've got an idea of what happened to you, and I understand. He don't. I'd like to keep you around, big fella, but Mr. Hunter won't have it. He's a mighty proud man, and he's got himself out on a limb with all this, uh, all his big talk about you. Kevick twisted his head, listening to the sound of McCarty's gentle voice. He put his paw on the old man's knee, and McCarty smiled and shook it again. You're getting pretty good at that he said. Well, let's go. You'll knock these, cities, these city lads dead tonight. Mr. Hunter's club was small and exclusive. It was situated in a grove of big trees, well back in the hills above the city. Tom McCarty held Kavik in an outer room while the banquet was in progress and George Hunter showed his slides. When Hunter came out and said, all right, Mac, we're ready for the vicious brute, he took the cane from McCarty's hand. You might as well wait in the car. I won't keep him long. He held Kavik into the. He led Kavik into the room full of people and up on a small platform. There, he removed the chain and ordered the dog to sit. Kavik sat on his tail, yellow eyes narrowed, and looked out over the sea of faces. George Hunter began to talk, telling about Kavik and his life in the North, his bloodlines, part wolf and Malamute. He told about the North American Sled Dog Derby and what it took to be a good lead dog and how important it what he was to winning the race. The room was warm. The air was heavy and oppressive with tobacco smoke. Kavik began to pant. He turned his head. There was a window near the platform. His sharp ears shot forward. His yellow eyes opened wide and his big jaw snapped shut. He rose to his feet his whole body tense. Throughout the room, people began nudging each other and smiling and whispering, look, he's posing, putting on a real show, just as if he knew George was talking about him, 
What a ham actor. Kevick was not putting on a show. It was a bright, moonlit night, and through the window, he could see the massive bulk of mountains rising against the pale sky. Flowing down those mountain slopes, like a loose cape thrown over, over them, was a forest. It looked wild and primitive. It looked like the mountains of his far northern home. Tonight, there was no chain to hold him back. He didn't hear George Hunter sharp, Down, Kavik, sit, sit, I say. He took two quick steps, muscles bunched, and launched his hundred pounds through the air. He struck the window and burst through with a tremendous, tremendous crash of breaking glass and startled shouts. Kavik landed on the soft earth amid a shower of glass, gathered himself, and streaked into the protection of the bushes beside the building. He heard doors slam as people rushed outside, voices called. He heard George Hunter's angry voice, a, and, ba and belly crawled to the opposite side of the brush and sneaked away. He came to a high stone wall and turned, following it, hunting a way out. Men searching came close, beating through the shru shrubbery, calling, Here, Kavik! Here, boy! Come, Kavik! Come on! He made a running leap at the wall and fell back feet short of the top. Another party of searchers came near, and he began to run in fear. It was bright moonlight, and he dared not show himself. He took advantage of every shrub, rosebush, rose and tree to keep hidden. He was slinking now in typical wolf fashion, trying to avoid detection. He was a gray shadow crouching behind a tree until a man beat past. He was a faint whisper of sound as he slipped through a rhododendron hedge on another man's heels. He was part of the rock itself as he crouched in the deep shadow of a boulder as a party went by, calling and beating the shrubbery. Finally, he crept through a laurel hedge and edged his way along its shadows. He was heading to the big front gate. The gate was closed. A group of men led by George Hunter came threshing toward him. The rock wall on either side closed in to form a narrow opening at the gate. He was trapped. Tom McCarty got out of the car parked nearby, hobbled forward, and looked down at Kavik crouched in the shadows of the laurel hedge. He looked up at the approaching men and called, Mr. Hunter, you'd better check that wall out back. There's a lot of brush for him to hide in that hide in out there, and the wall's pretty low. You might be able to jump it. All right, Mac, Hunter answered. We'll check the shrubbery in the wall right away. You keep an eye here. The search party turned away. McCarty watched them leave, then said softly to Kavik, All right, big fella, they're gone. You can come out now. He bumped and snapped his fingers and coaxed. Come on. It's old Mac. You know me. Kavik rose stealthily and crept to him. McCarty squatted on his heels before the dog and scratched his ears and patted his big head. So you didn't like him in there and decided to leave in a hurry. Fact is, you don't like it down here no more than I do. But you're doing something about it, and I can't. I know where you want to go, but it's further than you'll ever get. It's more than 2,000 miles of water and mountains and snow and ice and rivers and Lord knows what else. No dog on earth could cover that distance. I'd talk you out of it if I could, but I know you'll try. You'll wind up someplace, maybe even dead. That would be better for the likes of you than staying here. I cocked his head and studied the old man's face and listened to the gentle words he could not understand. But he did understand the voice and its notes of sadness and longing. He put a paw on McCarty's knee, and the man lifted the paw and gravely shook it. You know a lot, an awful lot. We had some mighty fine talks, didn't we? You let an old man dream about his past, and you were a gentleman enough to listen and not interrupt. I thank you for that. But it's over now. He glanced up, listening. They'll be coming back soon. You'd better be on your way. 
He rose and swung the gate open. He waved his hand outside. There it is, what you've been waiting for and wanting since the day you got here. It's all yours now. Go get it, big fella. Mush, mush, eat up that trail. Kevitt walked through the gate. Outside, he stopped and looked back. Goodbye, the old man called softly. Good luck. Tom McCarty closed the gate carefully and stood looking at the spot of thick brush beside the road where the wolf-gray form had vanished. Then he sighed and hobbled back to the car.